This is a story of self-reliance that has changed the way thousands of people live their everyday lives. It's a story of people who recognize the huge fossil fuel crisis that's been engulfing the world for some years. It shows the potential of small-scale, sustainable, renewable energy programs. Not just pilot projects, programs and technologies that have been in existence for decades. It's a story of people and communities in the Pacific Islands and elsewhere in the world who, often with the help of World Bank, have harnessed nature's immense, constantly renewable capacity for electricity generation. Only half the population of the Pacific Islands is on their national grid, while the other half relies on imported kerosene, prices of which are even more volatile than the fuel itself. On current estimates, there are about 220,000 households and small businesses in the Pacific without access to clean, modern energy. But, as we will see, there is also an increasing number of households who in their communities have created for themselves a modern life, one which is empowered by what nature gives us free, the sun, the wind, water, and the crops we grow. Wind blows at some 8 to 40 knots in the southwest corner of the island of Viti Levu. And the Fiji Electricity Authority, or FEA, has made a stupendously logical and highly profitable use of this wind speed. Facing up to the 200% hike in diesel prices in the last four years, the FEA drafted a new energy blueprint, one which in no uncertain terms states that by the year 2012, all of Fiji's energy demands will come from renewable sources. And this is how they are doing it. Butoni Wind Farm, Fiji's first wind farm, which is now its most successful, lies in Viti Levu, overlooking the town of Sigatoka. From the slopes of these picturesque hills, 37 wind turbines feed a no-smoke, no-emissions, 10 megawatts of electricity to the national grid. They have harnessed the power of the wind to deliver 12 megawatts of electricity annually to light up households and energize businesses. We have four megawatt generator in uh, Singatoka. So right now, those uh, generators, they, they're not running. The, all the ro uh, load that is supposed to be carried by those generators uh, has been carried out by this uh, wind farm. So uh, in terms of saving, on, it's on the fuel cost. Eh? So if, uh, FAA is saving in terms of uh, cutting down the fuel uh, cost. The turbines are retractable and in the event of a cyclone warning, as in January 2008, they can be lowered. You'll find more intelligent design on a corporate level in FEA's emphasis on maintenance and helping staff to set up service companies, reducing the costs of staff turnover and migration, losses common to utility companies across the Pacific. Another inspiring story related to wind energy is based in Husum, in Germany, calling itself the wind capital of the world. An idyllic place blessed with unparalleled beauty and a lot of wind, 
and home to some of the biggest names in wind energy production, the landscape around Husum is replete with successful, commercially viable investments in wind energy farms, with decent dividends for local community owners. With this kind of uh, burger wind park here, we have uh, we continue and have a stable income for every farmer here for the future. And uh, it's a good business, it's renewable energy and uh, we make money with it. And we make money uh, out of our own community. We can do it by ourselves. Dirk is a founder member of the village wind park which has tripled in size and generates power from 28 turbines and members. His farming company, Faithfully Organic, is now a wind enterprise too, managing four local wind parks and others in Germany, France, Poland and Bulgaria, providing the essential training and attention to maintenance. System upgrades are in his hands too. Under a repowering program, he decommissions and sells old equipment and installs more power turbines, all the while watching over the community's ownership. To meet the power demands of their 106 inhabited islands, the Fiji Electricity Authority also extended a commercial handshake to independent power providers or IPPs. They decided to purchase power from companies like Tropic Woods, a sawmill and wood generation company. In the past, Tropic Woods Industries has utilized wood fuel, their waste from the sawmilling process, to generate electricity to power itself. This waste from wood generation forms biomass fuel for its generator. The surplus of electricity generated through this process is now sold to the FEA, in turn lighting up more than 15,000 homes. I think we're changing uh, our portfolio products to lean heavily towards uh, electricity. Eventually we see ourselves as becoming an electricity company. Well, our total electricity production is uh, 12.3 megawatts uh, per annum. And out of that, uh, we consume roughly about 3.3 megawatts. That leaves us with a surplus of 9 megawatts. And the 9 megawatts would represent 5% 5, 5 of the total of the, this nation's total demand and roughly about 7% of this island's demand. Today, Fiji is the first country to successfully incorporate biomass technology to take care of 6% of its electricity demand. And that's just the beginning. Biomass generated electricity is transforming the way people live in villages in many parts of the world. Anglong Tame is one such village in the Batambang district of Cambodia that has been transformed into a destination offering new opportunities. With World Bank support, the village is now 100% electrified, completely powered by renewable energy. The source of energy is this biomass gasifier that uses the local leucana tree as fuel. The shops are open till late. The silence of the night has been replaced by television. The village has a new computer school. And the children now learn English 
in the new evening schools. The Village Community Electricity Cooperative has joined hands with SME Cambodia, a company that promotes renewable energy technologies by biomass gasification using the local leucana tree. The leucana is a fast-growing tropical legume tree which thrives on being coppiced or cut down to its stem from where it sends out many more shoots. It's a natural species on Pacific Islands. It does not compete with other food crops and grows in abundance demanding little land space. Leucana has changed the way people live in Anglong Tame. The gasifier provides electricity to about 300 households. Their monthly bills, plus income from farmers using an irrigation scheme, helps the cooperative to cover maintenance and staff training costs and to purchase leucana from farmers, forming a cycle of energy and prosperity. As well as generating electricity, it helps reduce carbon dioxide emissions, thereby earning valuable carbon credits. What we're mainly trying to do is create some kind of sustainable local energy source um, where you're growing your own fuel. And uh, especially in a country where all of the fuel is imported, uh, it makes a major contribution not only to the local community, but by reducing the imports of fossil fuels, it helps to uh, uh, contribute to the national economy. And in a tropical country like Cambodia, there's adequate land, there's sun, there's water, so growing biomass is uh, one of their best potentials. The project has demonstrated the potential for growing the trees. The community has had their own grid power, has then applied for and received additional funding to expand the system. However, we have noticed after two years, um, various enterprises are starting to appear spontaneously. These are things that uh, wouldn't have been imaginable um, prior to having the grid electricity. More Savvy has been growing vegetables all her life. But this year, she's had a bumper crop, thanks to the newly installed drip irrigation that runs on the surplus electricity available during the day when household demand is low. So More Savvy, like all the other farmers of Anglong Tame, does not have to depend on the rainy season anymore. Learning English is seen as an essential step towards maximizing opportunity the world over. And the English schools that have come up in the village function after sunset thanks to self-generated reliable electric power. This newfound use of the leucana tree has changed the monetary as well as emotional quality of life in Anglong Tami. This biomass-based power plant in Malavalli, in the southern state of Karnataka in India, generates 4.5 megawatts of electricity that feeds into the grid. The capacity of the local grid is about 12.5 megawatt that provides electricity to 12,000 households and small and medium enterprises across 45 villages. Sugarcane thrash we collect daily from the fields. One acre of cane will give five metric ton of thrash that will be collected from each land from the farmers that will be brought to the plant. This is processed through the shedders on the fuel part to bring it the sizing to 15 to 20 mm size. This is burnt in the boiler furnace which converts the water into steam. This steam is utilized by the turbine it rotates the generator and 
produces electricity. This electricity is being distributed to the nearby villages. Here is the simple matrix. Arrange a biomass, mainly agricultural waste, consisting of sugarcane leaves, palm fronds, rice husk and casuarina branches find their way to the plant every day. A total of 140 metric tons of biomass is required to feed the plant that is sourced locally from the fields in the vicinity of the plant. The power company MBBL, set up with support from IREDA, in turn supported by the World Bank, collects sugarcane waste directly from the fields and pays a small sum of money for it to the farmer. In return for getting this key biomass ingredient, crucial to its existence, they give the farmer free organic manure, made from the ash that is a byproduct of power generation. The benefits do not end here. MPPL also earns carbon credits for helping reduce carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. <laughs> As in Anglong Tami, life in the villages around Malavalli too have seen a dramatic change. From the erratic six hours a day of electricity that people were used to earlier, the average supply has increased to 17 and even 24 hours in some villages. We can meet the needs of rural India and small towns through sustainable utilization of our own agricultural waste, our own animal waste, and we have energy security for rural India. An initiative-driven village called Kivula in southeastern Sri Lanka offers another interesting success story with renewable energy. About 125 households in Kivula came together six years ago with the decision to make their own electricity since the national grid wasn't able to provide them any. They contacted Tony of Redco, a registered developer for micro-hydro projects under the World Bank scheme. Tony was sent to do a survey of the land and the river and to calculate the energy need per house. This was done keeping the base flow in mind, that is, the flow of the river in the driest month, to set up a micropower plant of 27 kilowatt. Each house was given a connection of 250 watts of electricity enough to power four lights and a television. Local villagers are trained by Redco to handle basic electric needs so that the model is self-sustainable. And today, Kivula has come a long way from the days when some of them were afraid 
to even change a light bulb. Empowered and confident, that backbone is the Electricity Consumer Society, which has one member from each household. The ECS, along with the villagers, collects the tariff and collectively takes all the decisions about the project. Which equipment to buy? How many lines to set up? How to function during peak hours? I would say this Electricity Consumer Society is the backbone of a village hydro project. Uh, because the success and the sustainability of the project depends on how well established this Electricity Consumer Society is. Because ultimately they will own and manage the project. In fact, it is this self-ownership model that has brought about the success of the project. Any mention of sustainable, small-scale hydropower would be incomplete without mentioning the Mennonite communities of Dutch Pennsylvania in the United States. For decades, they have been the true ambassadors of low-head microhydro and their machines are nothing short of heritage. This simple machine has been generating 24 kilowatt of uninterrupted power using a head of only 60 inches or 1.5 meters for the last 30 years. Enough electricity to power a few households and run small enterprises such as this lathe workshop manufacturing housings for the production of biomass generators. A community taking immense pride in its tradition, it has shown that it is possible to live off-grid in this day and age. And it has proved that small is still powerful. The most sustainable of technologies are those that make use of local resources. And Vanuatu has turned itself into a model of smart energy practices. Port Alry, a magical francophone town, with a population of about 2,000 people, is energized by oil from its staple product, coconuts. Rose's restaurant, lovingly called 
Le Bouquet du Village is the new fine dining place offering sumptuous meals with music. Uh, before we, you, you, we just use only candle, but now we, with light uh, we see that it's very easy for us. Now we are very happy when we see light. Tarsis stocks up fish in his new ice boxes for transportation to the big town, Luganville, without having to worry about the fish rotting. We fish uh, electricity coming in. We manage to make the ice. And uh, the fishermen, they take the ice and also uh, we save the the meat and the fish in the freezer and then we also use the ice to transport the fish all the way so they, they will have the fresh fish in town. All these activities are powered by a coconut oil based generator run by an electricity cooperative which buys its fuel stock from its members, coconut farmers. Oil from the copra of the coconut is fed into this community managed electricity generator to light up new dreams in this town. We have a lot of uh, difficulties with the uh, diesel, price of diesel going up, pension is going up. And uh, here we are, we have coconuts around, around us so that we can produce the, the oil and run the engine. And that is, it will help them because uh, there's no need to buy. There's no need to go all the way to America or somewhere around the world to, to get the diesel. We have the oil, we have the coconuts around, around in our corner. The highlight of this setup has been the innovative tariffs and distribution system that has been put in place using the smart card. This system ensures that people pay for what they use and now have the capacity for training local workers to maintain the system. Thus, there is an infectious rhythm that pulsates in Port Alry, especially after sunset. All governments in the Pacific, uh, not only Pacific, in the world, you know, they should be addressing the uh, needs of uh, the rural people in terms of uh, renewable energy and electricity. I just said today that uh, rural people here see electricity as a luxury. It should be totally the opposite. It should be something which every government in the world should be aspiring to do for their people. Our societies have always been known by how they handle their challenges. And these are testing times for the Pacific Island nations. The concern is not just over oil, but over our future, over the quality of our lives, over our survival. The stakes are too high to ignore. We need a definite resolve to light up and energize the Pacific. And much more than the pilot projects of yesterday, it is sustainable and proven programs of renewable energy that hold all the promise. But implementation will demand not just support from the World Bank, ADB, or ZAID, or other donors. 
First and foremost, it requires national commitment, local community ownership and power sharing in the literal sense of the word. All these are required to overcome the current fuel crisis and to realize a lighter burden, brighter future.